just when you thought we were gone for good. Hey everybody, we are back. Thank you so much for tuning back in. It has been a crazy last few months since the last podcast. The hiatus that we took, I'm speaking candidly without notes right now, so please forgive any stutters. The hiatus that we took was not voluntary, but it was necessary. To be honest, the the hiatus was quite embarrassing for me because as necessary as it was, the last thing I ever wanted people to associate with this podcast was an unfinished project. All of you who are listening, I am so grateful to you all because inside of six weeks, I think we had 2,000 downloads of this podcast, which is absolutely amazing to me because I'm, I'm starting from scratch. I have a circle of friends here in town in Pensacola and a few people uh, further abroad in different cities, different states, a couple over in the UK and India who I know keep up with what I do, but they're not a large audience. So whoever has been sharing, whoever has been telling their friends to listen, thank you, because you have made this project very worthwhile for me personally, and honestly, you are helping me to scratch an itch, which is I'm, I'm a bit introverted. It's a hard, it's kind of hard for me to go up to someone cold and start a conversation sometimes, so having this podcast is a wonderful excuse for me to reach out to people whom I find genuinely interesting, genuinely uh, innovative, genuinely creative, and say, hey, let's talk for a while. And it's led to some very good friendships, it's led to some good professional opportunities, to be honest, and it's just been, it started out as purely selfish, but it's turned into something where I feel there's true value in these conversations, and I'm so happy to be able to deliver them to you, the listeners. So thank you for your support with your time. Before we get on to that, I wanted to read something that I wrote and put on Facebook and put a shorter version on Instagram uh, about, about a week ago. This piece is a bit of a mission statement for me. You know, it's kind of like a song that you can't get out of your head. You just have to sing it for your mind to clear. I wrote some thoughts down on Facebook to kind of do a soft announcement for our new business, but also just to just to clear my own mind, and I'm going to share that with you now. I heard something good the other day. If you want to succeed at something, be obsessed by it. I take comfort in that statement. My work, photography, videography, content creation, this podcast, is an obsession for me. For the past four years, I have worked 40 to 60 hour work weeks while also shooting weddings, friends, small businesses, and personal creative projects after hours. In short, I've followed the Gary Vaynerchuk approach of paying the bills with the 9 to 5 and building something for yourself 6 to 2. Cool thing. It works. I get up at 4.30 a.m. most mornings. I exercise. I work. I stay up late. I shoot. I edit, I follow up, and I deliver. I consume medically inadvisable amounts of caffeine and live a life booked edge to edge with work opportunities that create more work. Alternatively, I could work a polite 40 hours a week, drink cocktails on Friday nights, and laze around on Saturdays and Sundays, but that's not really my style. To put it quite bluntly, it bores me. This kind of lifestyle that yields raised eyebrows and consistent remarks of I don't know how you do everything you do and you should take more time for yourself is exactly the kind of life that gives me the most satisfaction. Big breaks don't happen. Maybe it's purely an American sentiment, that classic trope of waiting for your big break or waiting for things to change. It, that mentality dovetails with the more recent social media friendly ideas of reaching out to the universe or sending out good vibes to affect change. No. No, no, no. The universe is an ordered system of gas and carbon. It has no personality and trends a little more toward disorder every nanosecond. Those expressions are a handy psychological trick to change your own attitude or mindset, and a positive mindset is integral to the process. But change comes from your work, and lots of it. Good work creates opportunities for more good work. If you tell me that you want to affect a change in your life, and yet you're always on Snapchat advising that you're bored or drunk, I'm going to stop listening. 
because you're wasting your own time. If you have time to be at a dedicated networking event at 5.02 p.m. on a Thursday, you're probably not working as hard as you think you are. There is an ownership deficit in culture right now. Your life is your life, and what you make of it, that's on you. So, what will define 2017 for myself and for Annie? This is the year that we took ownership and pumped the brakes in our own life. After four years of employment with intense commitments of time and energy, first to fund our wedding and later to simply explore the opportunities of those jobs, we've decided to stop moving with the crowd and we're building. With the full support of the marketing team at Innisfree, I am stepping away from full-time salaried employment and myself and Annie are launching our company. Move Media is about to emerge from dormancy and experience a rebrand as a content production studio and a marketing resource. Annie and I are making ourselves available and the response within our network so far has been unanimously positive and frankly overwhelming. Cameron Flask, my Instagram account will continue and we'll see some changes inside the coming month. Annie's working on a number of exciting projects right now that are hers to tell about when the time is right. This podcast is back this week, and I'm lining up more guests as we speak. It's going to be awesome. Annie and I have accomplished an incredible amount of work and made a lot of stuff look good while it's a sideline to our salaried employment. And you're about to see what kind of fireworks happen when we give it our full attention. And I hope you're wearing shades. Quit talking. Do something. Balance is boredom. Status quo is the fast lane to a slow death. Get obsessed. So, with all that said and read, I'd like to introduce to you today's guest. I first became acquainted with Glenn Kelly through none other than my lovely wife, Annie. She met Glenn back in 2012 when he was a tour guide on her uh, bus tour to Scotland and Ireland that she took after graduation. Glenn is an incredibly cool guy with a great story, and uh, after doing his time as a tour guide, he went back and finished film school and has since gone on to work with the Imaginarium Studios in London, where he works daily on the cutting edge of virtual reality, augmented reality, and visual effects for film and television in the UK. Glenn and I have had a really friendly acquaintanceship on social media for the last couple of years, and he told me how cool he was about all the cool content he did when he worked at Kentucky. So I friended him on Facebook, and he and I have, you know, monitored each other's progress on social media ever since. So this podcast was a good excuse for us to sit down and actually have a really good conversation together, and it it was fantastic. We actually delved way deeper into culture, society, and the importance of travel and one's personal perspectives than we did into actual filmmaking or virtual reality or any of the stuff that he and I actually both work on day to day. So without further ado, let's get into it. Thank you again so much for coming back to this little podcast that could. I thank you so much for your continued support. And I ask you to join me in welcoming to the podcast, Glenn Coco Kelly. Glenn, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me uh on the podcast. I appreciate you coming out, man. We're returning after a, a really long hiatus, actually, where uh, my life was kind of turned upside down and shaken a bit between work and then moving and then more work and then a little more moving. And now I think we're kind of leveling out. So I'm, I'm glad that we're we're finally here. And it's, it's really good to finally talk to you like voice to voice and kind of face to face on the computer because I've been following your stuff for so long. Yeah, it's the same here. It's 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 mutual. We've uh, it, it's been roughly. That's what I'm guessing now. It's six years because uh, uh, I met your lovely wife here in Europe. Well, not your wife at the time, and then uh, through that, I've kind of got to know you. It's mostly been through social media, really. Yeah, like uh, fifty-fifty Instagram and Facebook, I think. Pretty much, yeah, and it's it's been great, uh, kind of mutually watching because I think you kind of took up photography hardcore maybe a, a few years ago and it's been really enjoyable watching someone kind of chase that because it's what I 
was doing similar things kind of in into the film industry so it's, it was quite nice actually yeah and the feeling's really mutual because i annie after her ireland trip when you were with kentucky she turned me on to all your stuff and i found you on facebook and i loved watching like all the videos you were doing and all the photos you were taking and back before facebook changed their algorithm we were you know seeing each other's stuff and commenting back and forth a little bit more than than happens now but um no, I was, I got to admit, I was super jealous of you for like the three years I was watching because I had done a lot of traveling up until 2012 when I graduated from school. And then once I started working full time, it's like all, all the travel just kind of halted for a while. So I was living a little bit vicariously <laughs> through your photos and videos for a while because you would go to all these cool places and do all these awesome videos. And, and then Annie told me, you know, how, uh, how you know fun you were as a as a tour leader so I, I knew it was all coming from a good place and that it wasn't anything forced well it, it, it is a bit funny it, it, it's like anything I suppose um, it is a little forced I'm not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's there's aspects of the life kind of living in tourism that is is hidden from the general public uh, and especially even on social media like you don't see the the 2 a.m. reading notes on the oh. next city that you're gonna drive through and the and the not on your your lovely wife's trip, but uh, the, the 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 you know figuring out how I'm going to get vomit out of my pants before <laughs> the next day, and you know where someone's had a had a bigger night, and I've had to carry them or, or help them home, and I've, I've ended up a bit messy. But it's um, no the, the the tourism stuff definitely uh, came out of nowhere for me. Um, kind of working in that industry, I knew I wanted to travel, and I had been traveling previous. Uh, but it, it was it was fun, and it still is. I still, uh, as much as I've now moved on, I, I'm still um, still doing a little bit of it. But now it's the, the it's kind of the reverse now. Now I'm jealous of you. I'm watching you go to whiskey bars and, <laughs> and do weddings and that, and I'm like, damn, I wish I was back behind the lens, kind of uh, <laughs> kind of on the ground doing it, because I'm I'm doing a lot more production stuff at the moment where I'm not getting to pick up my camera. Yeah. Now, on the production side, have you veered more into um, kind of being the the controller, or the director, rather than shooting? Because I know you're doing a lot with VR at this point, which ha doesn't really have a, a camera itself as such. But uh. um, I, I suppose I'm more. Uh, my title is a is a bit fluid depending on the projects I'm doing at the moment. But it's I, I very much moved across into the production side of things, which is the more it's the less creative side. It's the more getting the creative people to do their part and bringing it all together as one. Um, and yeah, the VR side of things, I, I don't get to really play with the cameras anymore. I don't get to uh, to do that. But I do get to, it's a, it's a whole different mindset and it's, it's part of, um, uh, it's very similar to how I fell into tourism, how I did film. I, I get bored very easily. <laughs> and as a result, what I tend to do is I just kind of, once I've done something for a while, I will switch to doing maybe the same industry, but something a little different in that industry and a little bit different. Uh, and, and the Imaginarium is very much, I'm lucky in that this is the place for that. Like it's next level storytelling. It's, it's kind of what Andy set it up as. Um, so it's, yeah, I've, I've definitely moved. It, well, I say I moved on. I'm actually back to where I started when I was in Australia before I went traveling. I'm back to being a project manager, basically. Gotcha. And you're a dual citizen, correct, of uh, Australia and I UK? am. I am Australian and English. Yeah. Uh, well, it should be the other way around. I'm English and Australian. <laughs> well, uh, aren't, aren't most Australians both? I mean, what, what, which side do, wh which side were you born on? Uh, uh, I'm considered an Australian uh, first, but um, I've lived more of my life in the UK. I, I did all of my childhood, so my primary school years, uh, and that kind of preschool years were here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and then I moved to Australia uh, about when I was about 12, um, uh, I, we had a, a bit of a family tragedy, and as a result, uh, England was no longer the place that my mum wanted to be. Mm. Uh, and my dad, being Australian, was like, well, you know, I, I miss being in the sunshine and, and that lifestyle. So when I was 12, I got to, I got to move to a whole new country uh, where uh, I got the, the living snot beat out of me. <laughs> um, for for the first few months, because I had a very posh English accent, um, which uh, th that went away very quickly, <laughs> um, and uh, and then so I've had the I've had the luck of being able to grow up on two different continents, uh, experience they're they're similar but they're not the same culture, mm -hmm. 
they are very different in the, the way life is. Uh, and in a way, I'm very grateful for that because living in Australia, it's very beautiful. Everyone thinks of Australia as this gorgeous country with these beautiful beaches. Um, it's boring. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's only so many times you can go to the beach. There's only so many times you can go to the same pub and restaurant. Um, and, and I think that really drove me to want to see more of the world. And, and having grown up in England and knowing there was something else really back of my head was like, I, I need to go and see it. And, and that's kind of 2009 was when I really made the decision. Yeah. And, ha and what did that look like? I mean, I, I, I will say I've always been fascinated by Australia because it's on my, my bucket list of places to visit just because I feel like I've grown up in the American counterpart to Australia because in Florida it's really hot. Most of the wildlife is trying to kill you. Um, you know, it's it's just a I feel like they're flip sides of the same coin with, you know, different different cultures of course, but it's just uh it, it's always fascinated me just because it's such a diverse landscape and I feel like there's something in the water over there because some of the best photographers and some of the most beautiful models on Instagram seem to be coming out of the Gold Coast. I mean, I don't know if you'd have a different opinion having lived there, but that's that's the vision I'm getting all the way over here. I, I think I think with Australia, the big thing that uh, the reason that, yeah, like the, the Instagram and the photographers is there is that diverse, beautiful landscape. The lighting in Australia, you, 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 it's just easy. Mm -hmm. Like it's very hard. You kind of go an hour up the coast away from where I lived in Brisbane. You're on the Sunshine Coast. It's got these white sandy beaches, beautiful palm trees. The sun kind of sets in that beautiful, you know, it's, it's, it's everything you want in a photo. Uh, if you stick a drone up in the air, it's going to look good. If you go diving with a camera, it's going to look good. Mm -hmm. There's, it's just, just, it's one of those countries you just, it's, it's, it's abundantly beautiful. And it's, it's, uh, and the Gold Coast, you mentioned the Gold Coast. I live just north of the Gold Coast. Uh, Instagram models, it's, it's, it's like Miami or LA, basically. Gotcha. It's got that, uh, it, it's got that mix of like, it's young and it's hip and it, it seems to remain that way. Like as you get older, you move away from the Gold Coast. So the, it's, it's a cycle. I got you. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful region. Uh, but as I said, it, uh, for me, Australia got boring, which sounds really pompous, I know. But <laughs> culturally, Australia is a little bit lacking in, in, in things like theater and things like um, music and that. It's there, but it's, it's such a small population that it, it just never really gets the groundswell that it needs to go beyond kind of the introduction. Right. Uh, and and I love that. I love music. I, I play about six instruments, and um, and and I enjoy theater, and I enjoy that side of things. So really, for me, Europe was calling. Right. And to get to Europe, I decided to go through China. That's the way to do it. Yeah. That'd be a fun trip. So, so how did you get involved in the tourism industry? I mean, I kn you said you wanted to travel more, so and Europe was calling, so you went that way. And how did that segue into leading buses of young people all over the all over Europe? Um, so when I left Australia in 2010, very early 2010, I made a decision that I would like document my trip. The this year and a half was kind of in my head, um, and I started filming myself on a little the Kodak camera, like a waterproof camera. It's one of the first action cameras. Uh, and I made little videos as I went, and that got a little bit of traction. You know, YouTube was, this is 2010, so YouTube was there. It was a bit harder to upload to. The internet speeds weren't as good. But it was, I started building, just, just filming and, and editing and kind of developing that. Uh, and then I, I and then photographing, of course. I'd been doing photography for a while, but on that trip, like my my game, or my aim was, my game, my aim uh, was to really um, kind of improve because I was, sh I was shooting the same things over and over, I realized, in Oz. And, and when you're traveling, you, you don't get to do that because you're never in the same place again. Right. Um, and I basically worked the trip going across from China through Tibet, through Nepal, through India, uh, and then through Europe. Uh, as a way of improving my photography. And then I, I landed in London. I had spent all the money I'd saved up over the last like two years before leaving Australia. Uh, I was working in a hostel in London, like a backpacker's hostel. Uh, and five people came in to stay at the hostel one night. Uh, and they were all going for interviews with a company called Kintiki. 
and they, I, I knew Kintiki, I'm an Australian, you know, everyone in Australia knows Kintiki. Right. Um, and I'm like, oh, yeah, are they hiring at the moment? They're like, yeah, yeah, we're going for interviews tomorrow. So uh, end of my shift came at that pub, and I, I poured myself several pints <laughs> uh, and drank them. And, and I was a little tipsy, and I'm like, well, you know, Kintiki traveled Europe, that sounds fun. Let's put an application in. So a little drunk, a little, a little inebriated, I wrote what I consider to be a genius <laughs> application. It was mostly me making jokes. The, the, the main one being that I want to trap people on a coach and talk about German sausage making, um, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, Claire Hanny, who is a, a lovely lady who still works for the Travel Corporation, um, who was the hiring manager at the time, didn't find it as funny <laughs> as I had, uh, and decided she'd waste my time by getting me in for an interview. Uh, and to do the interview for Kentucky, they make you do a, a three-minute talk in front of this group of people, and you have to prove that you can do a talk. And she assigned me German sausage making. Uh, <laughs> and apparently, I made her laugh enough, because um, at the end of the group interview, she came up to me and said, I'd planned on wasting your time, uh, but unfortunately, now you're actually going to have to uh, come and have an individual interview, because we actually kind of want you to work for us. Wow. Um, so I got, I, I got through to the, the next round, and I got through that round, and I got through the 77 days of training with Kentucky, which is just, just possibly as hard as doing a university degree. It is an intense two months of your life. Um, and everyone assumes it's about drinking and falling down, but it's, there's no alcohol involved. It's 77 days on a coach around Europe, mm -hmm. um, writing every talk writing about places that you might never go back to, uh, learning how to deal with situations that you'd never think would crop up, but then immediately cropped up. Um, and, and so basically, I, I drunkenly stumbled into a career in tourism that lasted, um, well, it's still going technically, but full time, five years. Wow. Yeah. That is an awesome way to begin. So many good stories begin with one too many and then making a phone call or sending an email. Basically that, and it was this this application. Claire uh, let me read my my thing back a few years later. I was actually involved with hiring people uh, to go into the tourism industry. She let me read my thing back, and I'm like, "Why would you hire me? <laughs> like, I am. This is terrible. What in earth?" And she said, "Sometimes you you know, sometimes the, the it works out, and and I and it worked out. I I, I really loved my time in the tourism industry." Um, it's one of those industries where, on the surface, it's very superficial. It's, oh, you, you're going to take 53 people in a coach, whip them around the sites, and, and off they go back home. Um, but it doesn't end up being like that. Travel, and, and I've watched you and Annie travel, actually. I think we went India was the big one that I was really jealous mm -hmm. of. Yeah, we went but there the uh, year after we got married. Yeah. And it's travel, though, I, I, from even these short, like, say 12 day trips where they go through seven countries. For some people, that will be their first time ever experiencing another culture. Um, and I get the privilege of taking them through not just one culture, but in Europe, you're taking them through, you do seven countries, seven different cultures. And for some people, that completely changes their worldview from day one to day 12 of a trip. They're a completely new person. Um, and I really love that aspect of it. And it's something that I didn't quite understand going into the tourism industry because I was a bit cynical. But by the end of my five years, and, and to this day, I still really enjoy that aspect that somebody, that, that you're kind of opening people up to completely different ways of thinking um, without, I, I'm not lecturing them, I'm not um, forcing it down their throat. It's just experiencing other people's lives and suddenly they're a different person. Oh yeah, and that's something that when Annie was telling me the format of the Kentucky trip, it, I really, I was really impressed by it because I have this, this old kind of Rick Steves image in my head of a whole bunch of you know, middle-aged people on a wine tour who never quite touch the ground because they're always on a bus and they're always being taken from activity to activity, and Annie was yep. like, no, basically Glenn bust us to like a city square, dumped us out, and said, see you at 6 p.m. for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is exactly how I used to do it a lot of the time. I'd, I'd give them some information and occasionally a map, but um, so I, part of travel is getting lost, and part of travel is 
stumbling down an alleyway because you think it's the right way, but it's not, but you bump into something else. Right. Um, and I, I like to give them that experience because that's the experience I had when I traveled mm -hmm. for a year and a half, especially in countries like China and Tibet and, and Nepal and India. Like you just, you just kind of stumble through the, 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 the experience. And I suppose the way I always used to phrase it is the worst day traveling is still better than uh, like a good day at in the office. Oh, for sure. Um, and it's and it's that same thing. So yeah, I, uh, the, the format of Kentucky I think is often, and of group tours is often kind of people assume it's that, yeah, bus them site to site and then drop them here, make them go to this activity, get back on the coach. Realistically, this day and age, no one wants to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and and Kentucky is a youth product and uh, Oh God, their marketing department's gonna love me for this. <laughs> uh, but they really do care as a brand about the experience. That they're not in it just to, to get bums on seats. They're in it because youth travel is kind of the, the idea behind the brand. And youth travel is um, what, it's important, uh, especially in this day and age with kind of uh, the way the world is. Getting young people out to see the world, mm -hmm. to experience these things that sometimes they may have only seen on the news, is is massively important. I think it's massively important. Um, so it's uh, Kentucky is really focused on that, and uh, and a lot of travel companies are as well. I shouldn't I shouldn't just focus on Kentucky, but uh, I, my own experience is with Kentucky, of course. Oh, of course, and 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 it's so true because like I meet people over here. I mean, the current socio-political climate, the U.S. kind of pe people kind of give us the side eye walking down the street, you know, anywhere we go at this point anyway. But it, it's been my experience <laughs> that the, the people I meet who, you know, they're, they're trying to express their perspective on the world. But a lot of them have never been anywhere else. So their perspective is limited to one experience in one place with one group of people. And, and that's not to diminish their right to an opinion, but when your perspective is that homogenized from just one place, it, it limits your thinking a little bit. I mean, what right, wrong, or indifferent, you need that exposure to other people and other places to round you out as a person. And that's so, so important. I feel like so people get caught up in like the, the Instagram vision of what a trip looks like, you know, doing yoga in Mexico or pub hopping in Britain, and they forget that it's about the people on the way. You know, it's not about the selfie. That, very much that. I have a story that I tell um, about I was running a trip and it was going through Paris. It must have been the first night. The very first night. And this was probably only two years ago, two, three years ago. And there was a group of young girls from, I want to say Australia, but I, that would be just, I think it's just the default for me these days is to say it's an Australian or an American. Australians do travel um, a lot. They do. Uh, they travel a lot, uh, a lot, a lot. Uh, but I, we got off the coach um, at a, a photo stop that's really historic because it's the only photo of Hitler in Paris that's ever really shown anywhere. It's him standing overlooking um, so it's from Palace Chaillot, overlooking the Eiffel Tower and the Champs de Mars uh, and, and the um, Ecole Militaire at the back. And that photo for me is really important because it's three centuries of history in one single shot, mm -hmm. basically. So we ta I, always, I always try to take my people there. This girl got off the coach, she was talking to her friend, so she was looking at her friend. So she's looking to her left, so she's not looking at this amazing view. She's chatting to her friend, she pulls her phone out of her pocket, she turns the camera on, using the phone, she looks through the phone at the Eiffel Tower and this amazing thing, takes a photo and then turns back to her friend. And I walked over to her and I kind of pushed her phone down and I grabbed her body and I rotated her and I pointed her at <laughs> the site because a lot of people do go into travel these days with this kind of blinkers on that it's just about getting the photo and then back to whatever else is important and instead of and I'm I'm very very big in if you're gonna go to these places take the time to look at it with your own eyes because otherwise yeah just Google <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it's 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 funny and sad at the same time really I think, uh, it is. did you see that famous picture that, I, I don't know how famous it got, but I, I thought it was pretty cool, that was on Twitter, I think it was last September, it was from one of the staffers on the Clinton campaign, and she had just gotten off an airplane or a bus, she looked like she was in a travel terminal, and she's standing on this little, little riser, you know, waving to the crowd, the entire front row has their backs to Hillary Clinton, 
and they've got their phones up to take a selfie with themselves in the foreground and a blown out, you know, Hillary Clinton in the background. <laughs> and one of her uh, yeah. one of her staffers posted to Twitter and just said, "2016, y'all." <laughs> it's oh my, it, it just it, sums it, it does, up. It sums it up. The, the 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 selfie selfie is a thing, and I I'm guilty of it. Don't get me wrong, I do it. It's I run these days. I run older trips for a company called Trafalgar. It's a sister brand of Kentucky, and I have. 60 and 70 year old men and women doing selfies oh, like it, it's it it is it is transcended the uh, the age thing now it is very much everyone loves a selfie but you know the i would say the youth is more inclined uh to the selfie yeah. as it were yeah. but back to the travel regards to that um like you i you made a really good point there about the people kind of go into it with this preset mentality that travel is going to be a certain way uh, based off of Instagram and Facebook and these kind of stylized pictures that have had Photoshop and everything done to them. And when the reality hits in some instances, they're disappointed. And I, I've never quite understood that because to me, I, I like the raw places. I like the fact that somewhere isn't that picture perfect. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit, of, little bit of decay, a little bit of not quite the way it's sub uh, in my head was going to be. Because normally it exceeds my expectations. Like uh, I've been to some views that I was like, that photo is gorgeous. And I get there and I'm like, the photo doesn't do this justice. Like yeah. the photo doesn't capture the, the, the scope of what I'm looking at. The, the Swiss Alps for me is that. I, uh, as a photographer, I have tried on more than one occasion, probably every trip I tried to get a photo that I was like, that, that's, that's what you're dumb. Never in my own opinion, never quite achieved it. And it's uh, because it exceeds expectations. And, and every place I've been has done that. There's not a, not a city on earth, there's not a place I've been to that I wouldn't tell people not to go to. I'd never say to someone, no, don't go there. Right. Um, and, and that's kind of scary to me because I've realized I've been to some really dodgy places. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, those are some of the best experiences. I mean, for me, you reference the Swiss Alps. I this is probably one of my one of my favorite stories was the first time I ever went international uh, my grandmother passed away and left me a little bit of money so she had always traveled well so I thought okay so I'm, my first trip outside the United States will be on her dime I feel like she would approve of that so I bought a plane ticket pre-purchased a, uh, a year rail pass and just grabbed a backpack and went to Germany and I got there, and it was funny because there was a photographer that I had corresponded with a little bit in Friedrichshafen near the border. So I uh, went and spent a morning hanging out with him a little bit. It was my best introduction possible to Europe because I emailed ahead, and I said, um, I'm going to be in your area. I love your work. If you have a gallery, love to uh, get coffee with you or something. Just shake your hand say thank you for what you do. And he was like, no, no galleries. Just come to my house. We'll have coffee. So... I went to his house and we hung out for the morning. It was great. But we talked for so long that I, I missed the train I had planned to take. So I got the next one from uh, Friedrichshafen back through Germany south to Zurich. And then it was a Friday afternoon. So half of Zurich was going south to, yeah. to North Italy for the weekend. So I didn't have a reserved seat. So my experience of the Swiss Alps going from Zurich to Milan was standing upright for about six hours wedged in between the electrical compartment and the water closet and if i looked through the door into the next train car i could see out the porthole of the next train car and get a four inch view of the alps out the window <laughs> and uh what i saw was great I'm, i assume it's awesome but I, I saw about four inches of it for about two hours oh my god that's but that's a great story yeah. that that in and of itself i didn't even reference exactly that the baby that was uh uh vomiting on the floor and i had to like stand on my bag to avoid getting over all of my shoes <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's yeah that you've just summed up for me exactly like uh, the 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 when things go wrong when you travel they can often people get overwhelmed and they get freaked out and they're like oh no everything's ruined and i'm like no this is going to make the best story oh yeah to tell your friends like everything has gone wrong. That is the story you sit in the bar when you're 60, telling people over and over because it is hilarious and it is, it is. It sums up travel. It's gonna go to pot at some point and you're gonna have a terrible day, but it's gonna make one hell of a story. Oh yeah. Um, I have uh, trains are a, a, a feature of my travel as well. I, I'm a big fan of them. My my Indian train adventure was probably the best 
train adventure I've ever had. It was 16 hours late, which apparently is on time. Um, and I was sitting in the station, so I got to this station, and the policeman helped me buy a ticket by beating people with a stick <laughs> to clear a hole <laughs> through the crowd. So this, this lone Westerner with a hobo beard and like dirty clothes could get to the front in a terrible backpack. And I bought this ticket, and I didn't realize that there was a thing called tourist class. So I just bought a general admission ticket oh. on a train to in India. Um, That's always fun. Oh, it was it was it was it was a terrible thing, but it was the best story because I ended up this train was late, so I was in the station by myself, uh, just outside of Varanasi. I was like an hour away from Varanasi, but I just kind of got. I don't know how I got there. I just remember getting there, and. Um, this Indian family kind of took me in, in the station, gave me food, uh, drinks, tried to communicate with me as best they could. Their kids were, were, had, had pretty good English, but the, the parents couldn't. Uh, looked after me for like 16 hours, oh, basically, wow. <laughs> until the train came. And then I boarded this train, and I had a, it was like a 20-hour train ride um, in general class, like in just the standard carriage with all of the Indians. And I would just, it was the weirdest experience. But at the same time, it made me get completely over being stared at. It made me far more comfortable with completely foreign crowds. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because there was a little kid, I was reading my book for this trip, and there was a little kid who, every time I lowered the book slightly, I just had his eyes straight at me. <laughs> and this, this kid must have stared at me for about seriously the entire journey um, he was really lovely as well like he, he he came over and he asked me what I was reading and it just yeah that that trip really for me that the train trip in India um, it, it really cemented to me that I loved travel and I wasn't scared of it anymore if that makes sense I'd lost that fear of being late and lost and 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 that 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 and it's a bit like, sounds like yours as well through the Alps. Like you only got to see a little bit of the Alps, but kind of at the end of it, you're like, ah, it's like I kind of, I've got a story and I'm, I'm comfortable with this. I can live with this. Yeah, and I mean, it's almost like, it's not that travel loses its shine, but at, at the end of the day, you, you reach a certain point. Like my longest trip to India, I was there for about 35 days. And by about day 15, I stopped waking up going, oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. It was more like, okay, it's, uh, it's Tuesday. I'm in Rajasthan. Cool. Where's breakfast? You know, and it was just yeah. It just becomes like that's where you are, and it becomes you. It's it's life. It's no longer novelty, and you know that's that's when it gets special because I've been to India four times, never seen the Taj Mahal once. I'm always sleeping out in dirty places somewhere, and I prefer it that way to be honest, because I've. How did so? Because that's that's the I was gonna. I wanted to ask you that. How did you end up going to India with Annie? That was the that that trip. Because that, that's a mission trip. Yes. So um, we so I had done three trips before Annie and I started dating. So um, starting in 2010, I got a Facebook message from a friend of mine who's a police officer here in Pensacola. And he just uh, – he's a very dry, very funny sense of humor. And he just messaged me one day and said, hey, get your passport. We're going to India. And I just – I kind of smiled and just said, okay, got to get some details. And he said, okay, we're going to be doing stuff in the bush. This is not missionary tourism. We need people who can load trucks. You're pretty stout. We want you with us. So I, I was pretty stout at the time. So I, uh, I managed to cobble the money together and uh, went to India with this group called, um, uh, which, which one was it? it was, uh, the trip was called Christmas in a Backpack, and uh, the, uh, the group was called Net India. And we just went out there. We basically had backpacks full of school supplies, and it was it was relief work pretty much. And we were just going out to the villages, making sure the kids had you know some some hygienic supplies, some pencils for the year, and uh, and we you know cooked lunch for everyone while we were there. So that was the first trip, and that was in Bihar and uh, Jharkhand, which are the two of the poorest states in India. I don't know if you uh, found your way down there when you were over there, but it's. It's I don't I, I I might have gone through them I don't think I made it I don't think I stopped there. Okay, there, there's not a lot to do there, <laughs> but, but um the countryside is amazing, so that was the first trip. And then the second trip was uh I went back again the next year to do that, and then my third trip over there was I I knew there was something special going on. I wanted to spend more time there, do a little bit of, 
excuse me, a little bit of self-discovery. So I raised the money to spend basically most of my summer there in uh, 2012. So I went over there and made a big circle around the whole um, country. And uh, that's where I spent a lot of time on the trains that time and got very sick a couple times. But again, talking about having good stories, I wouldn't have it any other way. And yeah. uh, then the, the last trip uh, was the one I did with Annie, and that was with a different organization called Rahab's Rope, and they're into um, pulling women out of human trafficking. So we went over, oh, okay. yeah, it was, they, they do some pretty intense things, but they, they have this sustainable operation set up in India that's funded by some people in the, in the States where they will find women and just using, it's not, you know, white saviors going over there. It's like local people who are trained in this, who coax them out of sex trafficking or, you know, voluntary prostitution, set them up with work, with a job, and kind of rehabilitate them back into society. And kind of setting them up for, like, the new school in India that's a little more, for lack of a better term, a little more westernized, a little more, a little, little yeah. less mug hole, a little more 21st century, and helping <laughs> yeah. them just get, get back on their feet. And then the stuff they make, they do a lot of handicrafts, and they sell it back here at the States at their home office, and then they have a catalog that goes nationwide. So so that was that, that trip with Annie was very much in the vein of missions work, humanitarian work, um, and that was spending a lot of time in Goa, where I had spent a little bit of time uh, on my last trip. I stayed at a school there, but then we went to Goa and just kind of uh, – have you read the book uh, Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts? I – can't say I have heard of this. Y you would love it. But you would absolutely love I will it. It's I'll add it to my list. It's uh, it's about it's based on a true story. Uh, he, the guy was actually from Australia, and he had uh, gotten into trouble. He had tried to rob a bank, been put in prison, and he escapes. And he escaped, jumped on a boat, and went to India. So the book is him kind of weaving this narrative around his actual life, where he found his way into the slums of India and became kind of the, the token Westerner who lived among the people in the slums and was accepted as one of them and just kind of grew up from just barely getting by, found his way into the Afghan mafia, um, went to Afghanistan for a while, came back to India. Just And it's one of the most beautiful, like, this sounds so cheesy, but one of the most beautifully human stories I've ever read. And it is so accurate to India that the whole time on my long trip, I took two books with me. I took Shantaram and I took uh, Letters of a Stoic by Seneca. And uh, Seneca kept me sane. And then I would read Shantaram on the trains and in transit. And then I would look up and it was like I was still looking at the book because it was so accurate to the culture and to the sites. It was just really cool book. If you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend it. I, it's now jumped straight up to the top. I'm actually looking for books at the moment. I, I've read through all of my my current library, so I'm, it's now jumped to the very top. That's, nice. uh, that's going to be my next one. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, it, it'll hold you for a while. It's about, it's about that thick. <laughs> that's, that's not a problem. I, I like a good read. I, did, I like that you said Goa there as well, because that's the, that's the very Catholic portion of India I found when I was there. Yeah, they, they had a strong Portuguese presence starting in, I think, the 1400s. Yeah, uh, yeah it was... Uh, they were, they were, I found Goa to be this little kind of anomaly in India because it, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it is definitely different from the rest of the country, not necessarily in the greatest of ways. Like I'm guessing part of the reason the missionary work was there with that, that, that organization was because it, ha it has been westernized a little bit, which has kind of left it a little bit apart from the rest of India, it felt, when I was there. Yeah, uh, and some of that seems to be a little bit by uh, economic necessity in the present day because it's the closest beach to uh, Russia. So when, when I was there, I saw a ton of Russian tourists, and they were, they were having themselves a good time because I think that's one of the like, three states in India that has open alcohol sales. So yeah. I've seen a lot, of, a lot of Indians letting their hair down there and then a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Russians and a few Australians there tying one on as well. So it's uh, – it's, it's it's kind of like I, I, uh, one of the people I stayed with was his family. His wife's family was from uh, Manipur in uh, northeastern India. You know, it's like barely yeah, part yeah. of India. And he talked about how culturally Western they are in Manipur because they were just so apart from the rest of the country that they just absorbed a lot of influences from other places. 
And I feel like Go is the same way just because it's so exposed. You know, it just faces west, you know, and just is so exposed yeah. to tourism there. Still, though, I mean, the the tie the tie in there with Shantaram was uh, where Annie and I went was a lot of uh, slums, slum villages that were built around new developments. So the, the motif that we've seen there and that they write about in Shantaram quite a bit was Anytime there's new construction, this little shanty town builds up around the new building where all the workers move in, work on it till it's done, and then they bulldoze the huts and they go somewhere else. And we actually have some pictures, I think they're on our on mine or Annie's Facebook page, that we took of this little if you could carve out a little slice of paradise in India, it was this beach. And it was palm trees, clean sand, and this little little slum that had been built up there. And we took the last pictures of that place before it was bulldozed the next day to make room for a new resort. So it's just, it's just one of those interesting places where everything you read about, you see it, like the gentrification, the people being displaced, like it was all there. And it was a really fascinating place. I mean, it seems so Western to look at, but then you kind of dig in a little deeper, and it is totally its own little, own little culture. It's I, I the reason I, I I'm, I'm kind of focusing on India a little bit is it's it, it is a place that really grabbed my heart and it seems to have grabbed yours. We've been oh, yeah. back many times, um, and it's it's the reason is that I I find it to be exactly that. It it feels like the West until you scratch the surface. It's kind of as if they watched a Western TV show, and um, made the, the fascia of the shop that they'd never seen inside. So when you get inside like the Starbucks, uh, you know the equivalent there, you kind of. It, it's not what you're expecting at all, oh, yeah. Indian, but it's it's got the fascia of a Western business, and I, I love that. I, I found the Indian um, people to just, they just, it, it's, it's, I find it really hard to explain it sometimes. It's just, they're just enjoyable and easy, and they try, they'll they'll do everything to help you is, is the thing that I found. Oh, yeah. I think, you, you might have seen, I for my 30th birthday, um, I decided to go back to India and do a, a, a rickshaw race. Uh, it's the, the three-wheeled um, taxi. I was re-watching some of your um, videos from that the other day. Yeah, um, and uh, don't get me wrong, that is a very touristy thing to do. Like, it's it's not, like, Indians aren't all driving around in those, but it was it was to introduce my friends, two of my fr very good friends, who also work in for Kentucky and now work for, for, for some other brands, but um, to t introduce them to India. Um, and uh, we broke down more times than anyone else, and at not one point were we broken down by ourselves. Like if we broke down on the side of the road, uh, an Indian family or a truck or another tuk tuk would pull over and get us going again. Um, they, and I don't think it was just because we were, we were like Westerners. They genuinely, I noticed it with every truck that was broken down or every ritual. They, there's just a real, they've still got a sense of community there, mm -hmm. um, which I think honestly is lost a lot in in a lot of western cultures that we we claim to have communities and then when you scratch the surface and ask someone who's their next door neighbor they can't tell you right um and i think that's why i i, I really liked india because they still do all of those little villages know every single person mm -hmm. in the little village um whether they're a temporary village like the ones that you you, you were mentioning or whether it's, it's it's a permanent settlement um no i i find india to be one of those places i say to people it's not a first travel destination like I wouldn't say to people like hey yeah you never traveled before go to India <laughs> um, but it's definitely one I'm like if you've traveled enough that you're comfortable in yourself mm -hmm. go to India because you you will realize even more about yourself it's gonna it, it, it's the next level of travel I would I suppose is the way of putting it yeah it's almost like that scene in uh, Empire Strikes Back when uh, Luke goes into the cave and uh, he says, what should I bring? And Yoda says, uh, only what you already have with you. I mean, that's – that. It, it, it's like a mirror. It, it's interesting that way. Yeah. And it will test you, and it will break you. And when you break, you'll discover things about yourself that you might like or you might dislike. Like, I found personally that my patience was, was way too short. Like, I was get, I got used to get impatient so quickly. And – India really taught me that no, I, I just need to just stop. Let like things will happen at the pace they happen, and I it, it was it was that was my first trip to India. My second trip to India was the rickshaw race, and that I I I was very comfortable with myself at India by then. 
to the point that uh, the girls freaked out because they kept pulling us over at um, roadside food stalls and stuff, and they were like, no, we're going to get sick. I'm like, nah, we'll be fine. Didn't get sick until I had KFC. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. See, I'm not sure if so I ever had that yet. or not. Because the one day I got sick, well, I had uh, roadside tea and turtle curry in the same day. I'm not sure which one got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the roadside tea sh shops, uh, like chai tea on the side of the road, one of my favorite little things. I, I probably made one too many tea stops um, <laughs> on our rickshaw run. We, we came last every day, mainly because I would just, uh, along with the girls, would just stop. There's, as you said, you've seen the videos. There's, we, we decided we were going to play uh, cricket with them, and we got distracted by monkeys and all this stuff that, like, not on the planned route. Like, we didn't really care. We were just like, let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's just, uh, let's just experience that. Let's screw it. Let's go. Let's go there. Yeah, it's not a country you can do on a schedule. There's just too much to do. That as well. Um, kind of back to the tourism side of things. Uh, even on those like organized trips, people get really stuck in. I get the, and I, I have a feeling Annie might have been one of these people at the time, kind of have a really strict schedule in their mind of the things they're going to do and when they're going to do them. Um, and that uh, some people, and I once again, I think your lovely wife probably uh, was one of the quick ones to realize it. You, you can't do that. You kind of have to let go of that after a, a, a day or so and realize, well, I'll do what I can do and the rest will happen if it happens. Some people, some people don't. Some people are locked in on a schedule, <laughs> and it's it's crazy. Well, I, I, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but like I, I still need a decompression period to get used to it when I go over there, because I'm very, very regimented, bordering on OCD when I'm at home. So when I get to India, I have to like fall back into it. So actually, Annie adapts to it way easier than I do. I need a couple days before I can find my rhythm again. Because, but again, you know, even the the one time I got super sick, I woke up at two in the morning with such bad dehydration that I actually went blind when I stood up and spent oh dear God. it was it was an event and then uh, it was just two exits no waiting for the next six hours you know that <laughs> I, I was I had lost a lot of head weight that year head in the shower butt on the toilet pretty much pretty much uh, it was more like one and then I would like jump over the garden wall for the other <laughs> but it, it was one of those things where even though I, I lost like six hours on what was supposed to be a travel day because they had to call in actually a, a doctor from the village uh, a guy who was so hairy he made Robin Williams look smooth like he was just this inc interesting dude very nice he came in, set me up with some rehydration salts and some bottled water, and I just kind of laid in bed for about six hours. But even though we lost like six hours on what was supposed to be a day that we went to the train station first thing, hooked the train down to uh, Andhra Pradesh, it still worked out. You know, we mm. it still came together. You know, I was I was barely human for about eight hours as I sat at the train station with my my head on my arm and just prayed for death. But then I got on the train, curled up on a bench, woke up eight hours later, felt like a new man, and the trip went on. You know, it, it, it worked out. It always works out. It, it, it does. I, I had um, my, probably my, the, the big one for me. I, uh, on the, when I, before I left Australia, I set this kind of 30 before 30 list. So I had these things that I wanted to tick off. Uh, a bucket list, uh, if you were. I didn't want to call it a bucket list. I just I don't quite like that term. Um, I like to feel that I'm going to have a few of these lists. So it, it's a 30 before 30. I'm on to my 40 before 30. For the 40 before 40. Uh, but the 30 before 30, number one on that list was see Mount Everest. Mm. That was like the one thing I wanted to do. And I, I ticked that list. I ticked that off. Uh, and that is the day that is both, it was a highlight of my life and also the worst day ever. Uh, because I'd been riding for 10 days over the Himalayas and I got to the, there's a temple on the Tibetan side, on China side, um, Everest, on the way to base camp. And that is where we set up our tents. I say we set up our tents. The, the, the lovely Sherpas set up our tents. I was not in any shape to set up a tent. Um, and then they're like, cool, we're going to take you down for a hike to Everest Base Camp, to the, the, the starting point. And that's the demarcation line. You can't go beyond that unless you're going to go climb Everest. So we got to the line, 
and we sat down on a rock staring up at the highest place on earth and I cried and everyone next to me cried. Keith, who was like a 68 year old man, uh, was on the phone to his wife blubbering down the phone. Uh, just one of those moments in your life, like I, I can vividly, like, speaking about it now, I can just picture it. Everything, the smell, everything about it. 40 minutes later, I was on oxygen, being slammed into a van with no doors and no windows, and being raced down to a lower altitude, because alti uh, al my altitude sickness had caught up with me, basically oh, wow. kicked my ass. So I made it to Everest Base Camp, looked up at the thing I wanted to see, and then my body's like, cool, you happy now? <laughs> right, now you're gonna have a really bad time. So I was vomiting, um, I was quite severe, I was, I was bad, like I, uh, basically the, the tour leader at the, on that trip was like, look, you're basically your lungs are about to start filling up with liquid, so mm. we're gonna get you down from here. Um, so I was on oxygen in a van, bouncing down this dirt road to somewhere, this building. I couldn't tell you where this building was, I just knew it was about a thousand odd meters, kilometer lower than Everest Base Camp, because that was what they said you had to do. And I remember waking up in this tea room, in this, this, this bed in this like tea house. Um, and there was a woman in there stoking the fire and burning incense. Now, part of the problem with altitude is there's no oxygen. So burning incense is just filling a room with smoke uh, for someone who can't breathe already. Um, and I was, I, I probably had, that was about the same as you from the sounds, about like eight hours of just like utter horror. My body didn't want to do what it wanted. It didn't know what it wanted to do. I had no energy. I was shaking. And, and, but at the end of that, I basically emerged into the sun um, and was taken back to the, the group to continue the ride. But that, that, that day, it was like the highlight of my trip and also the low light at the same time. Like it was a horrible thing. But it didn't stop the trip. Like I was petrified that that was going to be like, right, back on a plane home to Australia. You know, all that did was kind of knock me down for, for eight, 11 hours, maybe a bit longer. Uh, and then I was back into it. And I, it's, it is still, as I said, that day, vividly remember that day. That, that is the, the highlight of my travel life, to tell the truth. And it's the day that I basically nearly died. <laughs> you got your 30 before 30, but you had to pay the man. What was that? Sorry? You had to pay the man to get that that item off your list. I, I did. I I had to pay the the price for, yeah. and a hundred percent that, a hundred percent that. And I, it's it's, it's very weird. Um, the other part of that story that I, I always miss, I I always forget to say it is, the the monastery that we were staying at, um, the the custom in Tibet, if you're going to stay on the grounds of the monastery, is you you give a gift to the to the monks, um. Anyway, it's pretty, pretty common if you're going to do any, most religions have a similar idea. Um, so I gave socks to them, because they don't want money, because it's no good to them. They live on the side of a mountain, they know where to spend it. Uh, they don't really want food, they've got the food they need, that's the, prov the village provides that. And I remember struggling to come up with something I was going to give them, until I got to the temple, and it was cold. Like, it was, it was summertime I was there, and it wasn't warm. Like it, we're, you're 6,000 meters in the air, it's cold. Uh, and I gave them socks, and uh, I felt that that was kind of my offering. Apparently that wasn't enough <laughs> uh, to the spirits of the mountain. Um, uh, but it was, yeah, I, that was, there was a whole ceremony with that as well. It's going into the temple and, and giving the gifts, and, and you know, it's, and, and yeah, apparently not enough, <laughs> not, for the, not for those ones. But it was enough to get you up there, and that's what counts. Yeah. But then, because I, I, I should probably, because I've been, I have been listening to the other podcasts um, uh, of yours, and uh, spirituality, faith comes into them a lot, which is something that I find in travel. So, uh, I'm not a person of faith in in, in the Western sense, um, but something travel has kind of, uh, kind of imbued in me, and I, I hope it does with everyone, is it gives you more. I don't want to use the word tolerance; it's the wrong term. It's it's a I've got a respect for the different religious faiths of the world now more so than I did before I went traveling mm -hmm. um, because it's it, you you find it's a, it, it's a theme throughout the world that within a communities especially in kind of non-Western worlds the thing holding those communities together are whatever 
religious faith they hold, be it Christianity, be it Hinduism, Buddha, Buddhism, um, I, I, and I, I gained a respect that I, I was very much a anti-religious person. I was uh, just, I didn't like organized religion. Traveling has reduced that in me. I'm not as harsh as I used to be towards it. Um, and I've had the pleasure of seeing three popes in the flesh, and I've uh, came very close to, to high-fiving uh, Papa Francesco uh, in St. Mark's Square. Nice. Um, but but the, the, the jokes aside with that, it's I, I, I do have a, travel has imbued me, and I hope it, it does for others, uh, a, a either strengthens their own personal faith or exposes them to the other kind of religious aspects out there and gives them a better idea about those things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how it was for you cause I, on, on your travels, um, but I, I did find the big one for me was I had 50 people uh, from America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa with me in Istanbul, which don't get me wrong, it's like Islam light. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's still, you know, they still celebrate the, 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 you still have the calls in the morning and to prayer and you still have the religious festival. We were there on Ramadan, on the break of the fast. Oh, wow. So massive street parties, basically. It's, it's just lines of tables and everyone comes outside at sunset and they eat. That's a lot of hungry people. And I had, yeah, but I had, uh, half the group was American and half the group was, was Australian. And this was 2000 and it has to be 2011. Um, and they were terrified, like genuinely, because the only thing they'd heard about like Muslims and Islam was the bad stuff, the terrorism since September 11. Right. And we were there on a day that of a religious festival. And I was like, guys, don't even be scared. It's a big party. And 50 odd Westerners, uh, I managed to coax most of them out of, the, uh, out of the, ho uh, the hotel, went down and kind of shared a meal with families and that in the street. And I, that's kind of going back to what I was saying before. It, it, the, their view on a certain thing, a lot of them shifted heavily that day. It wasn't this big scary thing that they see on the news. It was just a bunch of families sitting around eating food. Um, yeah. And, and I, I like that aspect. I'm not saying you know people would convert or anything like that, but it definitely opened, I could see that it opened a few people's eyes to the fact that there was a lot of similarities between, say, their own personal faith in one thing, and, and they said it's it's a family, it's a it's a celebration, it's a it's coming together as a community, and yeah, it's a. I found that to be part of travel, the bit that I love about travel. I, I, I keep repeating it. I've realised, but it's it is it's the it's the aspect I really do find um, uh, enjoyable for me in seeing it happen. Yeah, I mean it's 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 one of those things where when you get to a place, you kind of you know, you demystify it a little bit. You find, you, you remember people are people, and it's a very human thing to need that structure. Like, regardless of whether you're Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, it's it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's it's part of human history that the, the church, the synagogue, the mosque, that, that holds the community together. And, um, you know, there's, there's a great quote, I think it's attributed to um, uh, Isaac Asimov, where he says either there is a God or there isn't, both possibilities are terrifying, you know, and it's, and, and for me, that's the baseline of, like, my own faith, is, like, I, I want to accept that there is order in the universe, so, and that's my, my foundation, because if it's completely disordered, then, you know, let's, let's take our clothes off and go drink, because, like, you know, there, there's no reason, you know, and so accepting that there's order in the universe, and, like, for every faith on earth trying to seek that out, you know, that's, that's what human beings have done for years and it's uh, and, and when you as far back as as far back as we can find in most human records spirituality has played a part in community yeah and and when you go over there and even if you're of a different faith or, or even you know don't subscribe to any organized religion you get over there and you just find out how alike we are that we're all searching and and that I feel like that just that breaks down walls immediately it's, it's incredible very much, and, and and it's the openness of those communities. Um, I, I found it through every major religion that I've bumped into traveling has had the same thing. I've been invited into their place of worship or 
the community center run by their pastor, their rabbi, their imam. Um, it, it's, 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 it, it's always the same. And it, like you said, yeah, it's, it's, it's because humanity is fundamentally, regardless of where you are lucky enough to have been born, we're all pretty much the same. Oh, yeah. H have you ever listened to anything by uh, Jordan Peterson, the uh, Canadian professor? I have, yeah, he's I have. Recently, he's he's been quite big on YouTube recently. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know where your politics are, but he's he's come under fire for a lot of things he said um, based around, you know, where politics dovetails with free expression. But he's done some talks on religion that have been really interesting, like talking about the, the symbolism and the significance across human history of what's going on there. And I was listening to one of those the other day, and I, I can't remember a ton of it because I was in the car, but it was... It's just one of those things where when when you just look at uh, the broad view, a very macro view of the world, you, you realize just how how much of that has trickled down into every aspect of society. You know, that, that idea that you're you're looking up to something and you know, right, wrong or indifferent as the case may be across the world, it's 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 part of us and um, I don't know what it's like in the UK right now, but there's a trend in the US towards, you know, that, that trendy Facebook quote atheism that just ridicules people for having faith at all and yeah. I'm not against people being atheistic I mean that's everyone has their own perspective and their, their own reasons for being there but it's it's almost become fashionable to denigrate people for having a faith and I feel like that's regardless of what you think is right or wrong that attitude is a step backwards and like the whole idea of learning from other cultures is to take a step forwards so it's almost like we're culturally just kind of cannibalizing our own ideas at this point. I just it, it bothers me a little bit. I mean it doesn't keep me up at night, but whenever I see it I'm like, ah, uh, you know, you're you're not helping yourself with that attitude. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I do know that what you you you're kind of um, referring to. The UK is a little different. Uh, Europe in general, to tell the truth. We have a different approach. I think last census, the UK we were you know, everyone writes down Church of England, but realistically agnos ag agnostic was is pretty much the standard here. The the, the atheism thing, um, the trendy atheism, I think you're right, yeah, it is very much a, uh, well, I think, I personally think some of it is a reaction to um, s a little bit, I suppose, in the US, it, well, it's perceived here, uh, of the push of, of kind of the, the Christian, the lobby, the, the, the political wing mm -hmm. that's pushing kind of that into your lives, not so much ours, but what happens in the US, of course, tends to cross the pond. Um, a little bit of a backlash towards that, but at the same time, you know, my general approach these days is, is someone's religion is their religion and, and how they choose to practice that is up to them mm -hmm. uh, as long as it doesn't impact me. Right. That's kind of where I sit on the spectrum of political, religious joining. We are a little different here in, in, in Europe than the States. I was, I was in LA and, and that recently. Uh, and, and, I, and I realize you, the US is very much, religion is more important to you, I think, personally, uh, as, as a population. Um, personal faith is a lot more important to, uh, to Americans than it is to, say, an Englishman. That's not to say we're not religious. Um, but yet, it is, we're very different in that regard. And I think it's something that often is um, overlooked uh, when, when people cross the pond. I've, I, w I spent my uh, three months this year in Ireland um, taking majority Americans around. And uh, what probably the biggest request I got was, was for, for religious services. Where, where can I go to mass? Where can I go and um, see a pastor, communion? all of the uh, oh, excuse me all of the aspects of that and um, uh, that's not something I've ever had a British guest ask me or, or a German or, or a French person or even Australian to tell the truth um, it is an exclusively American trait <laughs> when you travel now were they were they asking for themselves for their normal practices or do they want the novelty of a traditional Irish Catholic uh, service um, I, I most of it was is, is their own uh, most of it was for their own religious um, beliefs. Uh, the, the mass was the big one. Okay. Um, a few people, yeah, for the Irish, and, and I have to disappoint them because the Irish and, uh, are not as religious as everyone thinks. <laughs> uh, that you, you go for, they've got a saying there, and it's going to pop into my head in a moment. It's the, uh, the, the hatching, the matching, and the dispatching. 
the births, marriages, and deaths. It's the three times you go to church when you're when you're if you're an Irishman. Um, they like to say that uh, God doesn't doesn't need you to be in the pews as long as you're sitting on a stool somewhere. He'll he'll be happy. Uh, that still happens to tend to be in the pub, but um, uh, Ireland's a Ireland is a is a is a is a very funny place for that. They are still very religious, um, but the 80s and 90s for them, uh, especially with the Catholic Church, there was coming out now is a lot of not very nice aspects uh, uh, that were covered up, and I think that has really give, taken a hit to their faith in Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that they don't believe in God and, 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 and that anymore, but I think they've lost faith in the church as a as a as a organization. Um, maybe once again, not at their local church level, but Ireland is is kind of sad in a way because it is. You know, when you think of Ireland, you think of, of of Catholicism and you think of the fight of Catholics to get their rights back because we the English are horrible and stripped them <laughs> of the right to own land and 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 own businesses. Um, but really, there. They are very much switching now towards a, a more personal faith, I suppose, um, away from the mass going to church. I think they've uh, speaking to a pastor in or a, a priest in in Ireland. Uh, he said to me he has about a six percent attendance, wow, uh, which is down from from the twenty five thirty percent of thirty years ago. Yeah, because that's something I noticed. The because. The places I've been to in Europe, it's almost like because the church was so involved in the in the politics of like nations going back, you know, as far as they've existed, it's almost like it, cultural religions, uh, religion, faith, whatever is important culturally, but not so much individually. Whereas in the U.S., it's a huge individual thing, but it's affecting culture less and less as time goes on. Which, honestly, I think that where every faith goes wrong is when it gets politicized. So I'm I'm more than in favor of you know church and politics being as far from each other as possible um but in in europe it's like it's almost irrevocably tied to the history of every country whether it's the catholic church or the anglican church in the uk and i had a friend who uh moved to oxford to go to wycliffe college at the university and he went for his uh his masters of divinity because he wanted to be a vicar and it was kind okay. of a funny story, you know, an American dude from Florida going to England to be a vicar. But he, uh, you could tell he had a gift for it early on. He was one of those people you just, you kind of knew. But he was telling me, and I can't recall everything he said because it's been a little bit, but he, he was a little bit surprised at first at how low church attendance was in a country that had so many historic churches everywhere. And he went to, I think he went to a place called St. Matthew's in Oxford, and it was... You know, I think he said barely half full on its best day. So, I don't. Know, it, it's interesting yeah. because when I, the first place I ever went into a, a foreign cathedral was in uh, Florence. I, I took an art history class in college, and it made me want to see uh, the Duomo. You know, more than anything, that was my stop when I went to Italy, and I spent my most time there in Florence. And when I went there, I was just amazed that you know I would go in to tour the uh, the basilica or climb the dome. And I would just look down into all these naves, and they were having full services with two old women, and that was it. <laughs> that uh, Italy is a, another prime example. Uh, yeah, the, the church attendance there is is low, um, and and you are. I think you're right there. That we have a different relationship with religion now. That the places of worship have become cultural sites that we must maintain. Mm but not so much attend. Uh, and it's, it is, the yeah, the Duomo, I must compliment you, Duomo is one of my favorite buildings. It's amazing. In the world. It's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely yeah. stunning. Um, but it, 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 you're very right. It, it, uh, but I will say this, though. It, it doesn't stop those, that going on. Like, they, they, they will, I, I, would, I s would say they will hold a mass even if no one is there. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think they will do that. It, it, it's got that feeling, especially in Italy. Um, uh, but it's it's. I just find it it's it's part of travel. It, it's it's interesting to go to those places and the history for me of religion, especially in Europe, uh, European history is like filled with, and I'm claiming it in the name of God, uh, <laughs> statements, um, and, and I, I do this because God's on our side. The French Revolution, 
um, uh, you know, Joan of Arc, you know, the English said they were fighting for God, and Joan thought she was fighting for God, and they came together, and oh, well, this is awkward. Um, <laughs> and that, that, you, you, that's, that's the story. That's, a, that's every war ever fought in Europe, basically, in the last 900 years, uh, in the name of, of uh, have been, I, we're going to go and liberate these people from this oppressive king, and the king's like, defend the land, God <laughs> demands it. It's just, it's just a, it, it's, yeah. It, and that's, I think that's maybe why we moved away from being super into organized religion here. Maybe that's why we've rolled off, is that we read, we get taught this history, uh, and you're kind of like, well, clearly either God was playing both sides for fun, or he wasn't involved with that whatsoever, and the church is just kind of, yeah. It's, it's very hard to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really weird one, and I, I've got to admit, I normally do avoid <laughs> religion as a, as a topic for that reason that I, I, especially when talking with Americans, I've realized uh, it's, a, it's an awkward one for me. But this is, a, this is quite good, actually. This is, a, this is uh, an intellectual discussion about religion, um, whereas I've, I have, on occasion, uh, with your fellow countrymen, um, been called uh, a blasphemous something or other <laughs> that I won't repeat uh, for my description of certain religious events. <laughs> That have occurred well, I mean, here in Europe. I, I always say that the U.S. never stood a chance to have any conversations on culture because we were founded by people who were so uptight and so puritanical that even Britain didn't want them. So, so, yep. so we we never really stood a chance for a balanced culture over here, and that and that's one reason I do this podcast is that you know just you know we barely knew each other before today really, but. I can kind of like suss out who would be interesting to talk to about everything, and and mo th my motif is uh, um, I like to take big swan dives into subjects most people try to step around, <laughs> and uh, it's it's kind of like that joke I saw a meme somewhere that said I promise I won't get political, and it says three drinks later, and it's a picture of Socrates with like one finger up <laughs> shouting to the people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's I I have to I struggle with it. For me, I do exactly the same thing uh, where I'm like on taking people around Europe and I'm like, fun, 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 happy times. And then the day will be coming and I, in my head I know it's coming. I'm taking them to like a Dachau or an Auschwitz, like a, a concentration camp or a death camp. And kind of fun Glenn just kind of nose dives into serious Glenn. And I get into history and I'm not... Professor Glenn in any way, shape, or form, but that's kind of history, part of history, especially World War One, World War Two, and some stuff leading up to it. It's kind of where I get super serious, and <laughs> and some people are like, oh wow, you 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 really went in on that. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, because it's an important for me. That's a uh, I kind of like challenging people's uh, kind of thoughts on that area. Uh, I've had some interesting discussions with people about. Uh, especially World War II, the lead into it, and, and Hitler, and the Nazism, and the rise of it, especially with current political <laughs> environments. Uh, both, not, I'm not just talking about the US, here in Europe, we are going through a cycle of history again, where early, like late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, exactly the same political climate. Mm. Nationalism rising, um, the kind of, what America would call far right, but w I just call it nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of that closing your borders, um, get kind of super into protectionism. Uh, all of that is starting to happen again. Um, and I'm hoping through all intensive kind of hope uh, that we're smart enough to look back at the history textbooks and that enough politicians that we have here uh, in Europe have, have know their history and know that it's a really silly thing to do. Um, and and you, 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 America, you guys are going through it as well. You're a teenage nation, you know, um, still kind of feeling your way out through this kind of the democratic process because clearly it's shifting. Um, clearly what you guys have done for the last 400 odd years since what, 1776, Brexit 1776. <laughs> Is it 1776? Yeah, yeah, that was that was the o yeah. that was the OG Brexit. They, that's yeah, <laughs> the original. Um, you know, you've got to this point now, and and I think it's a discussion that's probably happening in the states. I don't know if it's very nice discussion, 
but you're, you're talking about the way votes are counted and the way you elect your leaders and that, and, and we're doing the same after Brexit here. Um, you know, we're looking at politicians with, with a different viewpoint, like are they for kind of looking forward for 50 years or are they looking for the next election cycle? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you look at history of Europe, what leads to kind of this inward looking thing is that people are like, oh no, don't worry about everyone else, worry about ourselves, worry about yourself. What about us? What about your job? What about you, your home? Instead of, which I think Europe is supposed to be about, which I believe it is, uh, is we're all in this together and if we all work together, we can lift everybody up. Right. So all of these nations that are joining us, all these little ones on, especially Eastern Europe and Central Europe here, the whole idea is that, yeah, look, they're gonna migrate towards the West, to, to England and that to start with, but then they'll upskill and their countries will then benefit and then they'll go up. Like the whole idea of it is to kind of raise everybody up, the standard of living, middle class, everybody. Everyone gets a better life. And we're looking at it at the moment and we've got a rise of some very scary equivalent to skinheads happening in the UK mm. uh, that don't view it that way. They view it as what's mine's mine and you can all go away. Right. And that scares me a little bit because that's, that's a terrifying way to live in my opinion. Yeah, is that a group of people who have always been there and just kind of finding something to talk about now? Because I mean, England itself has been, you know, a huge hub for immigration since the 40s. So, I mean, has there, has there always been these kind of dissonant voices and they're just now finding something to talk about? Or is it this like a new new wave, do you think? I think a lot of it is the rise of the internet. And I hate to be, I, I, I'm turning into my dad, but it's this new avenue where everyone's on an equal footing. Um, you know, on the internet, everyone can have their YouTube channel and I think what has happened is it's given rise to the voices of everybody and in doing that it's brought to light these parts of society that were always there um, but but whose opinions were always kind of guarded and kept to themselves within their own little group. Mm -hmm. Now that little group here and this little group over here can put little videos up and start talking to one another and suddenly it, it gets a bit bigger. They suddenly realize they're not the only ones thinking it. That's it, I, I think you, Jordan Peterson, you were talking about it and, and his, his stuff with free speech. Um, I'm all for people saying those things. They can go crazy because the more they s talk about them, the more I hear these nationalistic kind of vitriol that comes out of them, the easier it is for me to turn around and debate those people and to kind of look at them and, and question why they think that. And w Here in the UK, a big driving force behind it is socioeconomic. Um, you know, we found if you look at the breakdown of who voted leave in Brexit uh, and their reasoning, if, if you look at the lower socioeconomic groups, um, their reasons were immigrants coming and stealing work, therefore they are worse off. So I'm gonna vote leave Europe because that will help me out. So they weren't really, I don't think they're racist. They are, but they're not, in their head it's not racism, it's, but I want a job. Um, that, was is a, that, a, I, I, that was a big thing over I here don't last agree year with too. It. Yeah, I don't agree with that statement, but I can, I can understand them when they say it. I'm like, okay, I get what's driving that. Um, that said, I'd like to grab them and be like, 98% of immigrants that come over work and pay taxes that pay the socio social security that you're on currently, <laughs> if you kick them all out, you, there'll be no social security for you. Um, but it's, it's, I, I find that the, the, the rise of those groups and the fact that they've got a voice, especially online, um, just leads me to have more conversations like this than I used to have. Um, a, and it, it is, it's a chance to, to push back against it. And I, I don't like the idea, and I think it's something that I, I noticed when I was in the States, especially being debated on, on some news channels, was this censorship at universities and censorship at, uh, in, in the workplace and, and in personally. Uh, oh, you can't talk about that subject. And I'm like, whoa, hang on. No, let them, let the person talk, listen to them, and then debate them on it. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. don't scream at them. Hit them with every historical fact. 
every time, and the same goes for politicians when they sprout lies. Don't scream at them and don't ignore them. Go back at them with the correct facts. Go back at them with the statistics. Um, we had it, the big one is Australia recently, my, my second home, uh, uh, and, 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 and gay marriage. Mm. You know, it took a, 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 a vote uh, by the people, non-binding, to tell the politicians to do the thing that every poll and every statistic had been saying for 15 years. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, but it was horrible and sad, but they had to, you have to, you have to let the people that don't want something yell and scream, and then you have to go back at them with the facts. Right. The real, yeah. And, and I've, I've, I've found that this, uh, that I'm having more of these conversations, kind of the way we're kind of going through different topics, but we're having, having these more and more now because of um, these dissenting voices are out there more than they used to be. Um, and I don't know how it is in the States if that's, a, if that's happening. But If you can imagine a fun house full of mirrors and you're hearing a lot of circus music and gunfire, that's kind of, that's kind of what the conversation is like right now. Um, people are very emotional about it. Um, and I'm, uh, maybe in the States I'm kind of a mutant because I can talk very emotionlessly about it and just be like, hey, let's exchange ideas, which I feel like is how it should be. But I also feel like there's been – just we've had it a little too easy for the last 15 years like until recently there hasn't been culture has been so comfortable we haven't had a ton of reasons to like sit down and have like good you know intellectual academic conversations about topics because up until recently it's just been you know up until you know I don't know I, I kind of I've got some mixed views on 9-11 because I feel like George Bush was position to just be an economic president and never got a chance to do anything because he's I mean how many presidents have had a ton of time to read to school kids in Sarasota Florida since 9-11 I mean it's been kind of a roller coaster yeah. since then but uh, as much as you know the the track of culture might have been hijacked I think it's ultimately even though some bad things have happened it's toward a good end in that we're being forced to confront issues now that we might have been too comfortable to confront 10 years ago and I think people are just now waking up to the fact that logic and debate skills are necessary to make progress because you talk about the university debates. I mean, I just looked on uh, Instagram or Facebook or something. I saw where uh, Milo Yiannopoulos is touring Australia right now, and there are the same kind of riots happening at schools over there that he had at Berkeley. And Berkeley was really interesting to me because that's been the, the poster child of free speech and dissenting ideas in the states and now they're trying to shut down ideas they don't like and i'm like dude you got this gay jewish guy who's going to give a talk for 30 minutes and get back on his bus just let it blow over you know i mean <laughs> and and people are like throwing trash cans through starbucks windows <laughs> over it and i'm like this is the school that's supposed to be taking these ideas head on and talking about them so you know it doesn't matter even what your political stance is this isn't the way to do it and but emotions have taken over because people aren't prepared to talk. I, I mean, I firmly b I want to give people the benefit of the doubt because even though I'm, I'm very cynical about a lot of things, I, I do try to take like a 30,000 foot view and say, oh, crap, we weren't ready for any of this. And we're having to do a lot of damage control right now. Yeah. The Berkeley thing, I, I think you've, you've kind of hit that on, on the nail on the head with that. That it is, it's the, especially universities, but like Berkeley is one of the ones that even as a foreigner, I recognize as a place that is like free speech. Mm -hmm. I've, I've watched talks from Berkeley. I know I have. Um, and the fact, yeah, the, this idea that silencing someone or not letting them speak will stop them thinking those ideas is idiotic and has been proven throughout history as the more you suppress that sort of a group, someone who has those ideas that you can hate everything they're saying, but if you tell them, no, you can't speak, they're just going to go and find a way of speaking in a hidden way and build up a little community underneath. And that's not what you want. That's how you raise domestic terrorism. That's how that's how that happens. Yeah. Uh, and history says that. And and you know the, the news. I'm not sure. I know that with uh, with government being involved in the news in the UK and a lot of places in Europe, it. I, I want to believe it takes a more um, moderate tone than in the states because right now, every news channel is beholden to advertisers. So instead of delivering the news, they are giving a performance for their market share, which. I think is is kind of horrifying right now with the amount of 
you know, false headlines you find on social media about all topics. But it's uh, – I was going somewhere with this, and I just had a brain fart. I can't decide if it's too much coffee or not enough. Um, but we, we've reached this emotional stage where – Everything that happens is milked by the media for views on both sides, Fox News and CNN. I, I'd, I'd like to push them on both on a raft and set the raft on fire somewhere and just start fresh because the, everything is so hyperbolized. And the, the loudest voices aren't the majority, but you'd think they were to hear it reported. I mean, I love or hate Twitter. I have a testy relationship with it myself. But, I mean, you get 100 people – collecting on Twitter, they can make a lot more noise than the, you know, million and a half who are just going about their daily lives and going to work, you know, it's, and, and that can be leveraged for good things, too. I mean, we've seen social media be used for, um, you know, Arab Spring and, you know, the overthrow of um, oppressive governments in the Middle East, but I don't know, I, I love this Joe Rogan quote when they talked about some crazy thing people were mad about on the internet, and he said, this is what you argue about when you don't have to gather firewood. <laughs> and it's a, it, 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 it perfectly you once again I I completely with you on this that the it, you it is the voice of the minority kind of is screaming and the the silent majority who are just like I'm I'm just trying to earn a paycheck and go home and play video games or look after my kids they're not out there you know screaming and ranting and raving and it's that that yeah these are the things we rant we scream about when you're not out collecting firewood. You could imagine it's the, the first world problem type, yeah. um, you know, thing that we live in. The uh, it's uh, I find the the news source stuff definitely having just visited the U.S. News there is presented very differently, and I'm not going to say in a worse way because I, I don't like to be that judgmental, but it's in a worse way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's. I'm spoiled. I'm very, very spoiled. You're right. Government is involved with our with the BBC, but I think the way it it's it's it is government involvement, but it's not. It's every single homeowner pays a license fee for a TV, which means that it doesn't matter what political persuasion you are, everyone pays 110 pounds a year to have the TV license, and that goes to the BBC. And as a result, they have a responsibility to give us the news the facts of the news with no slant. Now, uh, do they achieve it all the time? No. They make mistakes and they have to admit their mistakes uh, and they get fired for their mistakes. Um, my my labor leaning or uh, my left leaning friends here in the UK tell me that the BBC is right leaning and my right leaning friends tell me that the BBC is left leaning, uh, which says to me that they're doing a pretty good job. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, <laughs> that, that's good news. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then we get we, we we're lucky. We've got um, even our commercial stations, so Channel Four and ITV and all of that. As much as they have advertisers that do pay the revenue, when it comes to the news, what they strive for is to be known for doing the best for the news. Not oh, did how how are your ratings? It's not not their driving force. Um, and the BBC is the same. I think I I got I got yelled at when I was in the States, um, when I was in a, I, I started debating politics in a pub, which is never, or in a bar, <laughs> don't do that. Um, but he's like, oh, your media is fake news as well. And I was like, eh, eh, no. Uh, BBC has no ratings drive. They, they have, like the, the general public and the people that run the BBC and the government don't ask them how many people watch the news. They ask them, how did you find that news source? Is it accurate and is it reliable? And if the answer is no to those things, or if, if the answer is they found some drug addict in an alley who claims to have seen something, then that, that reporter's getting fired. Um, and when it comes to politics as well, I, I feel that A, our politics is a lot less crazy than, 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 uh, than yours. Uh, I'm pretty envious but not even right then, now, not going to lie. Yeah, you guys have got some uh, interesting events happening with your, your politics. But ours, ours don't, you know, the, our scandals, I the, scandal, the biggest scandal of the last 15 years was political expenses and did a politician get a, an ornamental bird bath cleaned on the taxpayer dime. Um, you know, one guy claimed moat cleaning <laughs> as an expense. Um, Things that don't happen in the U.S., moat cleaning. <laughs> yeah. 
but that's kind of the level of our political kind of <laughs> scandal. Um, we've got some stuff happening with, with child molestation and stuff at the moment, but even that is all, it was the 80s and, and like 70s and 80s, uh, and it's coming out now. Thanks to the internet, I should, I should say that. It's a lot of it is to do with the internet, but it's compared to the US, our, our news organizations get a, a bit of a softer time with the politicians, I would say. Yeah, and that's something, I mean, I feel like that's happening uh, worldwide right now because you know the, the whole abuse of power molestation is huge over here right now. And I'm, I'm glad that the, I'm glad that that topic is riding the wave, so to speak, and that in the UK, other people are coming forward as well because it's, it's something that, you know, I, I, I want term limits so bad for politicians because you have these people who have just been encased in their little walled gardens for so long. They don't listen to the people. They look out for themselves. And apparently they're, they're hurting a lot of their own people on the side, which is horrible. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm in the belt buckle of the Bible belt in America right here. And, uh, I don't know if the name Roy Moore has come across the pond yet, but if you want to be... I, I have heard of Roy Moore. Yeah, it's the most annoying thing in the world because <laughs> I've been tired of him he's for gonna years. He's going to win from the looks of it. Yeah, it looks like he's going to win. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I knew things were getting bad when the allegations came out and there were still like local people, friends of friends here in town, who said they were responding, yes, I'm going to the Roy Moore rally this week. I'm just like, oh, gosh, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, see, he got a lot of support over here because, again, coming back to the religiosity of the U.S., he was the big push, uh, big pusher for uh, the Ten Commandments to be displayed on government property and in Alabama, okay. which in Alabama most people wouldn't look twice, but the ACLU got involved, and, you know, you, you do set a precedent when you do that. So um, I think it was probably a good thing that they were taken down, but um, – Roy Moore has kind of been this martyr figure ever since because he was the one fighting to keep them. So there's a lot of people who are pretty much the, the same people who still refer to the Donald as Mr. Trump, who has a plan, uh, were pretty much the same ones, I think, who came out for that. Because most of the people I knew, my, most of the people I keep close to me, if they voted for Donald Trump, it was with gritted teeth because they just couldn't handle the prospect of the Clinton administration. But then there's this other contingent that are just, I, I, I don't know enough of them to describe them fairly, but they're just encouched in what I can only describe as Southern suspicion and just like like the the comfort of authoritarian establishment. I mean, that's that's the only way I can think of it. It's, uh, yeah, uh, the watching U.S. politics from afar at the moment is a, is a it, without being mean, is entertaining uh, for us, except that, it, it has an international consequence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just today, um, statements on the capital of Israel, for example, have a knock-on effect globally, and that, that's terrifying to me. Um, uh, but the kind of going back to the, we talk about like the, the, the molestation stuff that's coming out, and like Roy Moore, um, uh, we've had that here. Um, I'm glad that it's hitting kind of the industry I'm currently in, mm -hmm. because I'm not gonna lie, having moved into this industry recently, I have heard of these stories, uh, and I've only been in the industry for three years. You know, I've heard of these big names who, yeah, you know, you're gonna get invited to a party and you're gonna be expected, I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, really? They're like, yeah, if you're a pretty young actress and you want a role, you're gonna be doing some stuff you don't wanna do. I'm like, it, this day and age, with the internet, and with everything, that's how it works. And they're like, yeah, powerful men. Um, so I'm glad that that has kind of rolled out because hey, it, it opens up some, some uh, questioning the industry, especially, uh, not just my industry, the film and TV industry, but also politics, uh, big business in general. Like we've had some big name kind of it's, it's coming out, you know, secretaries from the, the 80s, 70s, 80s and that are coming out and saying, yeah, this stuff was, this was rampant in the office when we were there. You know, and these guys are still, you know, they were the managers of the time. They're now the GMs and the CEOs of these businesses and they're facing that now. Um, so it's, it's, it, I feel that that's a good thing. That said, uh, like with the Roy Moore incident there, it doesn't seem to be affecting his eligibility to sit in your Senate. Um, <laughs> 
which is terrifying to me. Uh, but you guys have got, is it the 2018 midterms coming up where you can clean house if you want? Something's going to happen. We're either going to clean house or we're going to go full civil war and just, and, and I'm not going to lie, there's a, there's a slight anarchist part of me that kind of wishes that in five years we'll be riding horses and duking it out over canned goods, but <laughs> that's, that wouldn't be ideal for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm you can the, the coming out next week is uh, Fallout VR. So just just do it in there. That's that's post-apocalyptic uh, <laughs> experience for you. I don't think it'd be as fun in real life. <laughs> you call it recreation. We call it training. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, it's it's an interesting one. I'm I'm with you. Like I'm the classic one is of course video game uh, and movies is the uh, zombie apocalypse. Like everyone's got a zombie plan. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but in reality, when I really think on it, no, I, I really don't want that event to happen. Yeah. That's, it would be horrendous. Well, it, it'd just be, you know, have the U.S. build a wall, but it'll be just be to keep us in. Just shut down the airports and wall off the coastlines. Y'all y'all be fine. <laughs> I feel like the combined power of the world at large could wall in America if they really wanted to. I, I think we, we would give it a good shot. The joke was when, when um, uh, Donald Trump was elected, uh, a lot of the papers and news kind of magazines here uh, did make the joke that, that we'll happily help build his wall, but it will, will be around the U.S. <laughs> we'll let you guys sort that stuff out, and then you can come out when you figured out what's happened. Um, uh, th I think South Park did a great one with the Canada, Canada builds a wall. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that episode, but I heard about it. Yeah, like it's the Canadian. Oh, we're going to build a wall. Stop the Canadians coming in, and Canada builds a wall. No, you can't come in here now. I, I, I love that. It's... it's uh, um, yeah, I'm not, I won't comment on the wall stuff. Actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll avoid it because it's touchy. Because I was I was also just in Mexico, so. Oh yeah. Now what? Uh, coming steering a little bit away from the yeah. political sphere. What what did bring you to the U.S.? Because I saw some great pictures coming out, but I, I couldn't quite get a feel for if it was pure pleasure, pure rec pure recreation, business, or both, or. Com completely recreation. Uh, uh, a uh, somebody who I took around Europe. Um, a few years ago, a uh, girl called him Martina. Um, uh, we kind of stayed in contact, just chatting, um, and she kind of her trip triggered her to travel more. That was kind of the she came out of uh, kind of her, a period of her life. She came and she traveled, and from that point on, she now wants to travel more. And I'd always said to her that if you know if she wanted to go traveling, she couldn't find anyone to go travel with her. I'll go traveling. Why not? I love travel. And it was her birthday, and she's like, I want to go to L.A. And I'm like, all right, booked the ticket to L.A. and came to L.A. That was genuinely the, the extent of the story there. <laughs> uh, there was very little foresight um, in, in planning it. I, I booked a trip, completely missed the fact that L.A. is 11 hours flight from the U.K. Um, not going to lie, in my head it was about six. Um, that's, that was that's a nice New surprise York. boarding the airport. Yeah, that was in my head, yeah. Um, but no, I came purely pleasure. Um, I've been to LA once before, back in like 2008, I think it was the during the Bush, no, not Bush, the Barack McCain uh, primary. Oh, season. okay. It was the last time I was in the states. The first time, the first, the first time Barack was up. Um, and uh, no, but this time was purely just to come out and experience the city as a place. And, and I did the tourist things. I rode a open top bus around and had an earphone in and went to all the tourist sites and got all the photos and yeah. Can you do one of those uh, bus trips without critiquing the presentation of the person who's giving it? Like, is it hard to turn no, that I off? I was, I was very scathing. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was funny. I, Martina was like, shut up, bro. <laughs> I'm just like, but this. Like I want to know more. I want to know about that. I don't don't describe the building to me. I can see it with my own eyes. Tell me about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I was I was definitely scathing. Um, but I was also because my title here at the Imaginarium is uh, for certain things is digital producer, and producer is a bad word in LA at the moment. Like the pro <laughs> the producers are the guys that are currently you know in trouble. Um, so I found that very weird as well because I was in this place that. It's kind of the mecca for filmmaking. You know, we the, the the studio system is the one we use here in the UK. A little bit tweaked, but still basically the way things run. Um, 
So I was excited to see it, and then all of that stuff came out. I'm like, oh god, now I, now it's kind of awkward. I can't go and yeah. Well, just but uh, just tell them you're a Twitch guy that you don't have the casting couch. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm the unfortunately I'm sitting on the couch. We we did think that when we wheeled this couch in for our weekly stream and put it on the stage, set the cameras up, and Rich and a few of the guys that I work with that we stream every Friday with, um, was like that. That looks a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Because it was just the couch against the white wall, uh, but then we put the props in and, and yeah. all of that. So it's um, yeah, it's a bit better, it's a little less creepy. No, no, it looks good. Okay. It does. I mean, a, a red couch makes it look like the YouTube logo. You're fine. A, 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 that was the a black leather couch surrounded by cigar burns. Then you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> Very much that. Yeah. But it's uh, I I love. Uh, I, I don't want people to come away from this thinking that I hate the states. I, I think I've been a little bit critical of, oh, of Americans on this, but we're critical ourselves really at this point. It's good to know that we're not crazy. No, but I, I really loved it. I enjoy the states. Uh, I will say this: young Americans don't know how to behave in an art museum. Um, I went to the Broad in LA to see an exhibit there, and they kept touching the exhibits, and I'm just like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but aside from that, no, I, I, I really enjoyed my time in the States. I, I found it to be um, very similar to all the other places I've been in the world. Everyone was friendly. I definitely saw some stuff that made me think that you guys have got some internal problems, but no more so than we have here in, in England. Yeah, coming back to our thesis that people are people everywhere. But, but it, granted, you were in Los Angeles, which is kind of like that, that splinter faction where everyone's like a, either a coder or a coffee expert. So it's uh, a little bit different than the rest of the country. But I've actually never been to L.A. I've been to San Diego, but I've, I've never experienced like the tech mecca of the states. I've just heard a lot about it. And uh, I used to work in real estate a couple years back, and just watching the, the economic trends through property prices have given some really interesting – insights into what's going on over there it, it remains like i don't know like that that asperger's cousin who drinks a lot of coffee and is really good at coding i'm just kind of like watching them from across the room at thanksgiving just saying okay what you gonna do next this is interesting it and it is i'm not gonna lie that what those guys are doing and we're involved so part of the imaginarium we are involved with sort of stuff that is being kind of developed in the states right now both actually just just near you in miami uh, as well as in LA and then Silicon Valley and all around San Diego and the other one that's north, I can never remember the. Oh, the San Francisco. Apple is. San Francisco. Yeah, that one. That's the one. Oh God. Um, is that so? Like we're involved with a bunch of projects currently that are going to be rolling out over the next uh, twelve months. And and as much as I hate to be the person, like I can't tell you more. But it's it's from somebody like myself. I'm a massive geek. I love video games that we stream every week because we like VR. Um, it's the next five years is going to be very exciting, not only in entertainment and gaming, but also personal life. The way this tech that's coming out soon will impact the way we do things. Um, it's very exciting to be involved with it. Um, and then, of course, I'm involved with some really cheesy stuff like TV shows um, <laughs> and, and that, that, that that make me lose faith in humanity, but it's fine. <laughs> well, you sent me a list on email of, of projects. I couldn't tell if those are the ones you have already done or the ones that are coming up that you can't quite talk about yet. They're the ones that are, I've done that I can talk about. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because it was pretty cool. I didn't realize how many just how many networks you've been involved with. I mean, it was really cool to see. It's 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 fun. I've, I've been very lucky. I, I benefited from my age, so I, I kind of moved into the film and TV industry in my 30s. So people kind of just assumed I have 10 years experience in the industry. <laughs> I just don't correct them. I'm like, yeah, of course, man. Well, yeah, of course. I've been doing this since I was a whippersnapper. <laughs> um, uh, and so I got very lucky, and I got to be involved with some stuff that I wouldn't have had I kind of been an 18, 19-year-old entering this industry. Um, the one that I really loved, I, I did a TV series, um, or helped create a TV series, I should say. It wasn't all me, uh, called Nurses Who Kill. Um, which is, I, I spent three months basically every day working through scripts and, and getting together the resources to make a show about nurses who kill. Like, each episode is a story about a nurse who used their skills as a nurse to kill. And it sounds super depressing, 
but it's so interesting. The more in depth you go into this stuff, like it's just, it's brilliant. And I wouldn't have got to do that if I wasn't kind of a bit older and transitioning into it. Um, Nurse Who Kill is on Netflix, I think, in the States. I've, I've seen it on it there. Is. I didn't realize you were involved with it till the email. And I got to be honest, I've had so little time for like new shows <laughs> lately that I'm, I like it took me a full year and a half just to get caught up on Doctor Who, which you know is near and dear to my heart. So it's uh, very, very much. I'll be, I'll be catching up on that in the near future. I, I should. That's a nice segue for me to say that um, uh, Peter Cabaldi, who is the Doctor, who is finishing. I had the pleasure of working with him last year. Really? Uh, he, here at the Imaginarium, uh, on the studio for a video game, he came in and voiced a a character for a game called CIG, Star Citizen. Um, and he is the loveliest man. Uh, without prompting, he talked to me about Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> and I was just the fanboy in me, because I was putting little shiny markers on him while he was in upstairs. Um, he started talking, oh, I'm, I'm, off, I'm doing Who at the moment in Cardiff. And I was like, oh my <laughs> god, this is the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. Um, and he was telling me about the, the ring prop that he got made um, and talking about the show and how it was, he was sad. The funny thing, they hadn't released it. It was his last season. Mm. Uh, but I got the feeling from the way he was talking. I was like, oh no, I think it's, oh no. Uh, but he was lovely. Actually, all of the big name actors that we've had through, something that I think is often lost with kind of our start, like, internal fanboying of them is they are just normal people mm -hmm. uh, and they're, 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 they're loved but I've, I've not hated them uh, any of them that have come through they've all been lovely but he was a he was a personal favorite of mine as well that, that's awesome he's been one of my favorite doctors since the show revived I mean David Tennant to me is hard to compete with and of course Matt Smith was excellent but and I, th I think Chris Eccleston you know didn't get the credit that he was due but Peter Capaldi just seemed to like capture the old school doctor, but for a new audience in such a great way. And I, I kind of like the cantankerous devil may care attitude as opposed to the Matt Smith's younger hipster vibe where it's like he, he cared a little too much. And then Peter Capaldi kind of reined it in and says, no, I'm, I'm a God. I'm going to act like one. <laughs> yeah. Are you, are you excited for the next one? I should ask that, actually, as a, as a fan. Are you looking forward to a female Doctor? I am. I mean, I'm only disappointed that it's not Dame Helen Mirren because I've was i been holding out that she would take a turn as the Doctor for years. But um, I, And I'm, I'm terrible with names. I can't recall the, the name of the, the actor who's taking on oh. the role now. Um, but I can't even tell the truth. But I love the look. Like, I saw the little teaser they did of her, you know, in the woods with the TARDIS. And I, I think she's going to be great because I know she's got a solid, you know, she's done great films in the past. And... You know, I, it doesn't make much difference to me whether the Doctor's a man or a woman. I just want the show to be well written. And that was that was a weakness I thought of some of the Capaldi episodes was just with Stephen Moffat transitioning out. Some of the episodes just weren't as cohesive as I would have liked. But the, the performances have stayed fantastic. So I, I'm, I'm always down for a good show. Well, that was actually with Peter here at, for the game. Something that, that struck me was... Uh, and I, if the CIG guys ever see this, I'm not knocking your work, but the, it was a video game script. If, if you know what I mean, that style of, it wasn't elevated, let's just say that. And um, Peter came in and just kind of went to them, do you mind if I tweak this as I do it? And just knocked it out the park. Like took this good script and just cranked it to 12. Uh, uh, he, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. He's. He was limited, I think, by the material that he was given on some of those episodes. I actually need to go back and rewatch uh, the the latest season because I haven't stayed as up to date as I I should do. And same as you, I'm struggling with time uh, at the moment to um, to 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 really watch things the way I need to. And I've got I've got a backlog of, of stuff to watch um, because everyone's suggested it but it's it's finding the time these days well and all the streaming services just won't stop i mean it used to be you had a show you had to wait nine months for a new season and now netflix says hey here's 10 new shows in one summer go yeah. and uh yeah I, I will say i did carve out some time to binge the punisher when it came out and stranger things because those were two like tent poles for my summer that i i knew i would have to see first and i haven't done punisher yet i i i, I definitely want to i i'm a big fan of comic book uh, adaptations from a personal, like from a writing perspective, because uh, 
my personal thing with sci-fi and, and comics themselves is they are a way of telling stories that you can't tell with drama mm. um, because it, it's a, you, you can't have those conversations. But if you make it a, a, a dude's beating up bad guys, cool, we can have a chat about, you call them different things, but you can, you can have metaphors for uh, current events and you can put them in. I, I love that. I think things like the comic book genre at the moment is great for that and sci-fi especially, any sci-fi show. Um, there's a Mars one on Netflix at the moment, which is kind of a mix between drama and, and documentary. So it flicks between 2016 and 2033. So it's amazing that cool. I think does really well at that. Oh, that sounds awesome. What's the what's the title? I think it's called Mars. Oh, it's just Mars. Okay. Mars, Mars 2033. Yeah, it's 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 got my favorite th geeky thing in the world, and it. it's got Elon Musk running outside during the. Uh, a launch of a uh, of a Falcon 9 rocket, the first one that they landed back on the pad, and it's got him running outside and watching it, uh, and then it doesn't fire as when he thinks it's going to fire to do the landing rocket, and he's like, oh no, oh no, oh no, and then you see this flame, and his face lights up, and he runs back inside, uh, and everyone's hugging, and it's it's my favorite geeky like space moment of the recent years. Um, and it's in that show, and I was like, yes, that. <laughs> I want more of that, please. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I'm going to look that up because that sounds awesome. And Elon Musk, it's almost like uh, Leonardo da Vinci's ghost woke up one day and said, what year is it? Okay, time to bring alien tech back to the humans. He is, for me, um, they need to uh, tell him every problem in the world and tell him you'll never fix it because every time he gets told no, it's like s commercial space flight's not ever going to be profitable. Oh, I'll show you it is. Yeah. Gets a contract for a billion to take stuff to the ISS. Electric cars will never be a thing. Give me a moment. <laughs> Goes out and builds an entire industry. Hold my beard. Like, it <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the, he's the hold my beard. And he, you're right. He's the Da Vinci. He, the, he's one of these guys that comes along that every time people say no to him, it seems to just make him do more. Um, uh, and, and he happens to have, you know, I'm just waiting for him and Richard Branson to have a money fight um, over space. Yeah, sorry, my connection broke up for a second. What did you say he has? You say he happens. I to was have like, I'm waiting for for Richard Branson and and Elon Musk to have like that that like Batman versus Iron Man money fight type thing. You know, two tech billionaires just <laughs> just throwing money at each other and having a bit of a fight because it just they the you see I've always loved Richard Branson because um, of his kind of foray into the ballooning and aeroplanes and then. Elon's come along and kind of stolen my heart, um, uh, but I, I think they both, they're both into space now, which I, I love. I love the, my 40 before 40 list, one of the items is to go to space and be paid for it, so that's, uh, I want to be a guide. I actually wrote Richard Branson an open letter, I think, when he bought uh, Spaceship One, when he got involved with that. I'm like, I d I'm a tour guide, I'll happily take people up and point out stuff. I'm good at that. That's I've got a ha track record. Let me up there. Oh, man. You, you want to hear an interesting Richard Branson story? This is a uh, second hand. Yeah. I have not met him, but I, for the last year, I've worked for a hotel company uh, doing their marketing photography. And we recently had a uh, the new assistant general manager of the Pensacola Beach Hilton, who's a running candidate for one of the most interesting people on earth. And he was a consultant for years and opened a place in uh, Barbados called the Pink Sands Club. If you, if you look this place up on social media, you'll find it's like one of the most drop-dead gorgeous places on earth. And he was there. He consulted on the design. So basically, it was the staff was invisible. The hotel was a big U-shape with a central hidden corridor so everyone could like just do all the maintenance, all the room attendant stuff on the back end. And all you saw was clean presentation. And it was the sort of place that didn't have a check-in desk because it was the kind of clientele that they don't roll up with their duffel. Their people do it, you know? So one of his fun stories he had was Richard Branson did a corporate retreat there for some 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 subset of the Virgin Empire. You know, it was his uh, directors or sales team or something. And they decided to do a big breakfast in the morning. And Richard came up to Ian, who's this guy I know now in the company, and he said, so I'd like to move it outside and do breakfast in the water. And he was like, by the water? No, 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 in the water. It's like, OK, we have about 12 hours to make that happen. Um, you know, your guests will be wearing resort casual and be prepared for breakfast in the hotel. And he says, gosh, I keep doing that. 
And he said, I'll cover the clothes. I'll buy all new stuff. Just make it happen. So they moved heaven and earth. And the next morning, all the guests came down at the right time for breakfast. And Ian met them at the door. And he's this big guy with a big voice. He's like, please follow me outside. They go outside the door. And all the tables are on buoys. And they're floating. There is an omelet bar floating on the water with a chef standing hip deep in the surf cooking omelets for people and Richard Branson is just there in his linen pants just standing in the water waiting for everyone and they, they made it happen and it was all just because Richard had this wild hair and just wanted to create this whole new experience like on 12 hours notice just for breakfast I mean he's just he's one of those interesting people that comes along like once or twice in a decade I mean in a generation it's just exactly that and that's I, I love that that sort of stuff uh, I grab on to uh, and we're involved with a couple of guys on some projects that are like that mm -hmm. and are run in that circle and that is them like that story you just described yeah that's how they think and it's like I kind of wish I could think like that I I, I, I wish in the, or hope in the future I can but they do they operate on another kind of they're like I'm just gonna do this yeah and people they buy into it. I think that's like SpaceX and and Branson's kind of uh, kind of businesses. People buy into the brand of of them mm -hmm. because they're like, this guy's crazy, but his track record says crazy works. Right. So I'm gonna this. I want this. I want to be part of this. Oh, it's that old yeah. adage of people don't buy the product; they buy the personality. And that's he's just one of those people that has personality to spare. It's just it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. That, oh, it's uh, it is it's very fun to be around those guys. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it over the last six months, uh, being around that stuff. And and the next, for me, the next five six months will involve dealing with a lot of those type of people. Maybe not personally, but as part of the projects. Uh, and I am thoroughly looking forward to it. I'm terrified a little bit <laughs> about it, um, because it's. As you can imagine, those, those sort of people, there's a pressure that comes with that. But they, I, at the same time, I relish that sort of stuff now. Um, uh, I, as I said, I think I said at the very beginning, I get bored quite easily, and I like challenges. And the next six months, very much going to be a challenge. Well, I look forward to seeing the seeing the product. Now, the next six months will be production. So, the fruit of that labor, or when would that be coming to the public eye? Do you think? Or well, some of it kind of by February, some of it not until much later in the year. Our kind of realistically, when you look at films and TV, you're talking two years, mm -hmm. really, from, you know, I, and it's something that I struggled with when I first came into this industry. I was very much travel filmmaker mindset, which is like, shoot it, edit it, upload it, done. Yeah. Um, that's not how this industry works. This industry is very methodical, very, you do this bit, and then you do this bit, and then you edit this, and then you review that, and you go back and you shoot some more stuff, you fill it out, and then you grade it, and you clean it, and then you release it, um, which is a lot longer timeline that I was I was expecting on things. But at the same time, the end result, like the difference in where I was at with filmmaking and where I am now, are uh, worlds apart. Um, yeah, very much so. Wow. Well. Glenn, it, we've been on for about two hours, and we didn't even really get to um, how you got to Imaginarium from travel, but I'm, I'm glad we had the conversation we had. I'd love to stay on all day, but I actually have to bug out for a shoot in about an hour. So That's, I, um, have, I have to do the same, all actually. Right, cool. Well, Glenn, this has been really awesome, and I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I'm, I'm really excited about this one because I've been on a huge hiatus from doing podcasts, and I, I can't think of a better way to get back into it. So thanks for, thanks for being here today. No, not a problem. Thank you for having me on. It's been it's been really fun, and uh, hopefully we do more of this. Maybe not podcast, but get to know each other a bit more. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, my sister is actually teaching in Japan this year, so Annie and I are trying to find a way to get that direction for a bit. But so long as we're going to be doing long flights, we're going to see how much capital we can get together. Just keep the trip going, and hopefully make it UK way, or or just go someplace interesting. But if we make it over well, to the UK, you will not avoid us. I promise. <laughs> Brilliant. If you're if you're here, um, definitely come in. I'll give you a tour of the studio and and uh, show you around. That'd be fantastic.
Well, Glenn, before we sign off, could you uh, give your uh, social media handles and where people can find you and uh, the name of your Twitch stream and everything? Okay, yeah, so you can find me uh, social media-wise. Uh, I'm on all of them, but um, on Instagram, it's uh, Glenn GK Coco, all one word. Uh, on uh, Twitter, it's at G Kelly Briz. Uh, and on Facebook, you can find me, but Facebook's become a little secondary <laughs> these days. But the big one for me is uh, every Friday, hopefully, uh, going forward, 4 till 6 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, we stream live on Twitch on The Imaginarium Studios. Uh, so if you just look for us there, we're a VR stream. Uh, we have a lot of fun. There's a back catalog for about five episodes now. Um, the best one so far has been Doom, so go check that out. Sounds good, man. Well, thanks again, Glenn, and we'll be talking again real soon. Brilliant. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.